Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Menachem Creditor. It's my honor to serve as scholar in residence and rabbi for UJA Federation of New York. We bring you Torah and music, blessing and community every weekday. We've been doing so since March 18th, 2020. Today is March 15th, 2024, just about four years in to this community that we created together all around the world in a moment of unbelievable need. Just about four years ago, when there was nowhere else to find each other, UJA gave us the chance to create this community, and here we are, broadcast 1014, many, many months and experiences later, and we have created a community of good, sweet people all around the world. It's good to see you here. Penny and Arlene, Jerry, my beautiful Ariel, so good to see you. Michelle, good morning. Carl and Debbie, Rose, Arlene and Cecile, Rosa, Booker Tov. Let's see who else is joining us. We're going to sing a bracha and learn some Torah so we can start a good day. Zoya, good morning. It's good to see you. Anya and Marsha, Jerry and Janice, you are here too. I know you are. Marilyn and Lisa, Judy and Barry, Jacqueline and Susan, good morning. Valerie, Barbara, I hope I didn't skip anybody, friends. The screen is moving a little bit fast. We have a lot of sweet people jumping in to today's broadcast. Natalie and Peter, good morning. Robin, Arlene, and Rabbi Cantoresa, missed you. All right, let's see. Hi, Ron. It's good to see you, my friend. Hi, Lydia. Let's take a breath, sing a blessing, and learn some Torah. Shari, we're going to continue praying for your husband. May he become strengthened, may he heal, and sending you comfort too. Chana and Debbie, and Roberta. Okay, here we go. Thanks for bringing us to India with you. It's good to see you here. And if you're looking, friends, for a way of anchoring yourself in, uh, in our homeland, I'm proud to say that, at least on the Instagram version of this broadcast, I am so proud and joyful to be connected with my daughter, Ariel. So thank you, Ariel, for bringing us all with you where you are. Today is broadcast 1014. It is day 161 since October 7th. There are lots of ways of marking time, and we both mark ourselves within this world and our calendar year. We know that our four-year anniversary of our broadcast is going to be this coming Monday, the 18th. We know that it is Parshat Pekude, the last Torah portion of the Book of Exodus, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And um, it is also day 161 <clears throat> since October 7th, and so, there are a lot of swirling thoughts. And since it's also Friday and Shabbos is coming, let's uh, begin today's broadcast by just taking a breath. I'd encourage you, whatever's going on in your life right now, just take a breath. Take a breath. It's 
in the early days of this broadcast, we um, learned how to breathe again. It was the beginning of the pandemic, and we needed reminders to breathe. With everything going on and news reports that are frustrating at the very least, with heroism being shown by leaders of Tzahal, the IDF, who are speaking out and demanding politicians worthy of the sacrifice of soldiers, men and women, young men and women. Um, it's been a big week, as they all have been. And we are remembering our loved ones. I wore um, a pin with Omer Shem Tov yesterday, who's 21, a hostage who's been held by Hamas. Today I'm holding a pin of Elia Cohen, who's 27 years old. As we have prayed every single day, bring them home. Bring them home now. Let's learn a little bit of Torah, dedicating ourselves in the same way that we have since October 7th, which is for the wholeness and healing of our people, so that we can get back to the work of healing our world. We perhaps thought that we were further ahead in being seen as fully human by the world around us. Jews have had a checkered history when it comes to being seen as fully human. You might not know this, by the way, for all of the complicated way that race spells out specifically in America, the census in America that is conducted uh, consistently, it's a constitutional obligation of the government to know who is in the country, um, categorizes people and always has as white or Pacific Islander or and there have been a lot of ways uh, that black people and people of color in general and immigrants and people with different ethnicities and genders, all of this shifts the way that the, you know, in the way that the government accounts them. Only in 1942 were Jews categorized as white. You might not know that. Now, the racial divide that that indicates is something we need to discuss on its own. But how powerful it is to remember that Jews and whatever whiteness means in America, it's, it certainly shouldn't be seen as a compliment in the way that it's been used. It's a way of talking about racial superiority. But it relates in a very powerful way to this week's Parsha. And I'd like to simply point to something in the Parsha that could inspire, because there's been so much in our world, our history, as we've come to re-understand it. The further ahead we go in time, the more essential it is to look back and remember the context. We think about the world being as it is, as if it's always been that way, and that's not the way that it's been. The Torah reminds us that we've been here before in countless ways. So here's one <clears throat> specific part of the Parsha that has moved forward in time it's changed significantly in the way that it treats people, and it's shifted for the better. It starts beautiful, because in this week's Parsha, we hear about the glorious furniture that filled the Mishkan, the tabernacle. In fact, with the end of this week's Torah portion, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, is dedicated, and we know it works because God's cloud, whatever that means, fills, it arrives and it fills the precincts of the the, of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. So much so that Moses doesn't have room to get in, and I've long thought that that is a very complicated part of the Parsha. Poor Moshe, who has done so much to hold our people together and to grant us all space as we move forward from enslavement to freedom, to promise, that Moses can't get in feels like such an indignity. Now, I'll, I'll say more about that when we begin the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, next week. But for Moses not to have room says something about how people count. Now, it might actually push Moshe into the people. If he were able to enter the Mishkan, he would have been different from the people in the intimate, surrounded by the cloud of God, not only up high on Mount Sinai, but also here on this plane, on earth itself. We'll get there. We'll talk about that next week. But there's another element of this Parsha that relates to how we treat people. When we talk about the Mishkan, the tabernacle, we often then talk about the interior of the Mishkan, including the furniture, the altar, and 
the Ark of the Covenant, and there's a lot to say about all of this. When we hear about the clothing that the priests wear, and the high priest in particular wears, um, we hear about ornate clothing made of gems and gold and copper and specific kinds of thread and crimson and lapis lazuli, you name it, if it's precious in the ancient world, it would be um, part of that clothing. And the names of that clothing is also interesting. Excuse me one second. Baruch Adonai That helps. The names for the clothing are fascinating, and we're going to get to why they continue to be interesting to us today. There is the mitznefet, which is a head covering, a tzitz, which is the um, the headband that's at kadosh ladonai, holy to God, designated. There is the meil, the jacket, the ketonet, which is the tunic. There is the michnasaim, the pants, is the chagora, the um, the belt. It's fascinating to see how ornate the clothing, the wardrobe for the high priest was. It was fabulous. And we talked uh, just yesterday about how the hem of the meil, the hem of the robe, has um, uh, bells and pomegranates all around it. I mean, this is really something to behold. Now, you might know this. You might know this. Um, there is uh, there's a quieter and very holy part of a Jewish community, literally called the Hever Kedisha. means holy community. It is the group of volunteers that are part of a Jewish community that takes care of us when we die. And it's traditional to not talk about participating in the Hever Kedisha. It's not really about being known or seen. It's quiet. It's humble. And so there is, there is an important way of seeing this week's Parsha and the holiness of taking care of any human being when they die. The names of the clothing in this week's Parsha, the special stuff that designated the Kohen, it is the exact same names for the clothing that we call now Tachrichim, shrouds. They're all equal. They are glorious, because by the time someone has gone through the process, when their body has gone through the process of being prepared for burial, at, with the gentle care of the Hefer Kedisha, the reverence shown the mate, the person who has died, the Hefer Kedisha dresses that person. And when they are done, they are so beautiful, just like the priest which is another way of saying that through time the idea of reverence for the priest being in the service of the divine connected to God is actually universally true in the human community. All of us are treated with such respect, reverence, exalted, as if we were in the center of the Holy of Holies, closest to God. And when we die, that's that's where we are. That's who we are. And yes, as Rabbi Cantoresa points out, that is also the way the Torah is dressed, with the same kind of robe, belt, often with silver and or, uh, ornate uh, coverings, with the crowns that have bells and pomegranates. We, similar to Torah, are the way into experiencing the divine every human being is. We are called a mamlechet ko'anim. We're called to be a kingdom of priests mm -hmm. worthy of this kind of adornment and reminded that it doesn't need to be made of the precious materials for us to see each of us as precious. Among the ways that I hope we will walk into this Shabbat is humbly a recognition that all of us in the end are treated just like the high priest, which means we shouldn't wait until then to treat each other with that kind of dignity. Every one of us, every human being is precious, all of us created in the image of God, which is why our hearts break so at the thought 
of suffering for our children and our grandparents. We need to remember that what we are fighting for is not something extraordinary. It is the sublime gift of being seen as fully human that we are fighting for. And in moments where we don't have to fight for it, which feel very far away at the moment, our task in the world is to recognize everyone as fully human and to treat them with such dignity that we remember that they too are the high priest just as we are. The language of Exodus perhaps isn't as universal as I think modern Judaism offers. But we began somewhere. We began with a recognition that we didn't deserve to be enslaved in Egypt, that God cared about us too. That is a core thing. Every human being, every community deserves it, deserves it. So we have an obligation to make sure that when we talk about each other and when we see each other and when we try to work with each other, we see every other as fully human. So too, friends, must we demand to be seen in that way. As we go into Shabbat, the final Shabbat of the book of Exodus, I just bless us to know how loved we are for being exactly who and how we are. And for us to pray for the day when our family is made whole again, so that we can get back to the work of seeing every other as human, as holy, as worthy, as loved. That's the vision of the world, at least that the Torah teaches me, and that I believe we could offer the world once we get our feet back on the ground, once our eyes can see the sky and believe that everyone who deserves to be free is free under it. So I bless you. I bless you with this. I bless our children with this. I bless our grandparents with this. I bless all of our family members, citizens of 33 countries, members of at least three faiths, who are still being held by terrorists for 161 days. I bless them with this too. The knowledge, the deep, incontrovertible knowledge that they are loved, that they are worthy of respect, and that we care about them so much that we will continue to shout for their dignity and freedom. I'm holding one face, not that I only see one, but I'm holding Elia Cohen's face very close to me today. He's 27 years old. We miss him so much. Bring him home now. Bring them all home now. Let's sing Hatikva. Work our way into Shabbos, friends. Here we go. Kolon balevav penima Nefesh Yehudi Omiya Ulefate Mizrach Kadima Ayin Letzion Sophia On Lo Avda Tinkvateinu Hatikva bat Shnot alpain liot am chovchi beyard zenu erz zion virushalayim liot am chovchi beyard zenu erz zion and just before we go into Shabbos, friends, let's give ourselves the gift of a little pick-me-up, just for you.
home now. Am Yisrael Chai. Shabbat Shalom, friends. See you on Monday for our four-year anniversary. Take care, everybody.